Talking About Horses, bringing you closer to some of the best horsemen in the world for tips, insights, and stories. Listen at home, at work, in the car, or in the saddle. This is Talking About Horses. Here's your host, Patrick King. Hey there, gang. Patrick King here, and I want to thank you for tuning in for episode number 31 of Talking About Horses. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by equine professional and award-winning author, Anna Blake. Anna, thank you so much for joining us here on Talking About Horses. Oh, hi. It's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Thank you. So, uh, Anna, for those of you that, or for those folks out there that are listening that don't know you, can you give us a brief bio? Uh, who is Anna Blake? Um, I always introduce myself first and foremost as a horse advocate because uh. I think our job is to put the horse first. Um, and I started in horses like a lot of us did. Uh, my first babysitter was a horse. And uh, uh, I am a gray-haired woman. You may refer to me as a gray mare of a certain age. And if you meet a woman of my age who comes from the West Coast, you should assume, of course, that I started in a Western saddle. Uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, kind of like you. And um, I found out about dressage, and everything about it appealed to me. I feel like uh, it's just a great discipline for horses and um i have uh, been training for almost uh, 20 years so i'm kind of a late bloomer uh but that's pretty much who i am fantastic so you said that you started western and then dressage appealed to you uh what uh, what was it how was your introduction to dressage um Well, again, back in those days, I I live in Colorado, Mm -hmm. and um, uh, it was not a booming event back in those days, but uh, I was a rainer, and that was before we did freestyles and raining, and my background is as an artist, and so I really love the creative aspect of freestyles. I saw dressage freestyles, and um, I recognized this form that was not unlike a martial art meaning you would begin at one level and go up the levels. And I really wanted that notion of uh, a path that would take me somewhere farther than what I'd had before. Um, In all of my writing disciplines, I kept looking for things that involved, uh, to my mind at least, involved more relationship uh, with the horse rather than... um, Oh, see, now I'm going to say something bad, and I've been doing really well up until now. (laughs) Um, I flunked out of Western Pleasure. I'm just going to blurt it out. Mm, I flunked flunked out. Yep. 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 Uh, I think think you and I are probably on the same page there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, everything about dressage was really appealing to me. And I understand, I am not uh, blind to the current culture. Uh, I understand that there are some things going on today that um, are not what the writers of the dressage classics had in mind. Yes. Um, And, you know, that's fine with me. I am uh, choosing to not hand my discipline over to them, and uh, I'm sticking with it the way it was written and the way it's been taught. That is so very well put. I really like the way you said that. Well, I defend dressage a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, had, I've had experience, and if you, uh, I expect you have as well. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't know, that really resonated with me just there. I really like the way that you said that. I really like that. Um Great. Okay. So, uh, let's, let's get a little bit deeper if you don't mind. So you said you have, um, a background as an artist. Can you tell me more about that? Um, I was a self-employed artist for 35 years. I had no goal of becoming a trainer. I was actually, um, you know, I was that hyper obsessed amateur 
Ah. That road, yeah, ah, exactly. <laughs> I clinicked with everybody. I trained full time with, you know, trainers. I, you know, I just loved my work and I loved uh, horses. And so um, I was actually a goldsmith, which okay. is, I think you're going to say, not unlike being a farrier, except. You know, we just share ambles. That's about all we share. <laughs> there you go, um, right? I, I did one-of-a-kind work that showed in galleries across the country. And uh, it put me in a position where I could board two horses and ride all the time and set my own hours at each. So it was a wonderful, uh, you know, it's a, a great life. I've had a great work life. That's awesome. Yeah, that would give you a lot of freedom to pursue the riding that you wanted to. Yeah, and, um, you know, uh, don't ever feel sorry for me for any reason at all. My gallery opened at 11, and I left home at 6 in the morning. And I have to tell you, I haven't had such consistent riding uh, since moving to the farm, not once. Uh, yeah, you know, exactly. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. I, I moved to the country, put my breeches on, and walked out to the barn and fixed fence for two hours, <laughs> and then came back into the house. <laughs> right? Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah, it was a real, it was a choice, you know. Yes, yes. Um, it's so funny because I, I give advice, and it almost seems counter to what uh, the average horse owner or horse lover would think, but I give advice all the time to my students that are boarding. Uh, they talk about building a barn at home, and it would be so much nicer to have my horses at home. And I say, gosh, why would you want to do that? You know, you'll have no time to ride if you take them home. <laughs> but it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's well, a different way of it, life, though, having them home, for sure. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's true. And, you know, for me, um, <clears throat> it was, it, you know, I had that experience where uh, everything in my life conspired for me to uh, uh, take a jump to something I didn't know. And um, uh, so that's what I did when I moved to the country. Yeah, okay. That's great. That's great. Um, so let's see. So um, a goldsmith, you've got your, your artist background, and you're also an award-winning author, and I see you have several books that you've written, and you have quite a blog going on there. Um, you, you also list, and I, I love this, on your website, it says that you write parables about horses and life. <laughs> well, it seems like they're the exact same thing. Aren't they? Uh, it seems to me uh, that... You know, horses have taught me more about getting along with uh, horses and people and dogs than uh, I've learned anywhere else. Um, I, you know, a few years ago, a book came out, some title like, I learned everything I needed to know about life in kindergarten. Mm, yes. And then there were kind of a plague of books like that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that about the barn. You know, it's where I've made my best friendships with horses and with people, it's where, uh, you know, the, the biggest feeling of connection and, um, you know, all of the positive things in my life have all happened in the barn. And so, uh, you know, for, for me, they're kind of the same thing. Some people, I, I have readers on my blog who tell me that they don't have horses, and my blog gets shared in dog communities sometimes, and oh. sometimes people tell me uh, they use my advice with their kids. I don't have kids, so I won't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, um, I think, uh, it, well, uh, uh, Patrick, I'm going to put you on the spot. I think Ray Hunt used to talk about this. Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What did he say? Oh my goodness! It was it was so much about um, you know he, he would talk so much about the uh, a lifetime. He would say it takes a lifetime to learn how to live a lifetime, you know. And he would always relate that back to the horses and how everything that we offer to the horses, we have to look first within ourselves to to check for congruency and to see the way that we present ourselves to the horse. If that's a way that's fitting to the horse. So it very much like exactly what you're saying, it's that, that parable, horses in life, you know, and it, it, he definitely helped me to think more about how I present myself 
not only to the horse but also to the person uh, am I am I saying something that they are able to comprehend and am I saying it in a way that they can best comprehend it you know there was so much of that uh, that went yeah. through there yeah and it, and it is you know it's it's like you said it's it's with dogs it's with um, with kids certainly with kids um, I have a I have a daughter I have a she just turned eight years old and I used to joke that I was going to write the book on round pen parenting um, <laughs> but, but, but the truth is at this point I think I've I'm the parent that's been stuck in the round pen you know um, she's she's learning how to work me over pretty well um, but, but it, it's interesting uh, because I find that she has even learned at her age uh oh it sounds like you've got the volume on there it just came up on my screen. I'm back again. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. There's a there's a couple second delay in that video, um, but yeah, she's kind of learned how to put herself across there. I've found in a way that um, that helps it to work. Kind of like Ray was always trying to get us to do with the horses. You know, uh, little things like, you know, Dad, I don't need any new toys, but do you think we could go and see what they might have? Just in case somebody else is interested, <laughs> I'm like, oh man, she's got me figured out, you know. <laughs> I, am, I am sorry to say this so early on in the conversation, but you know, mares—they're just smarter. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. There is that. <laughs> they just—they just are. <laughs> I will give her that for sure. I will give her that. <laughs> Oh goodness, that's awesome. So, um, what I noticed from the list is that you've got four published books, is that correct? Yeah, one is just now in the process of coming out. Ah, okay. So, here's what's great about writing. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I've always written a little bit, not much. But I had a book I wanted to write that I've wanted to write since I was little. And um, and I didn't think I was a good enough writer to write my book. Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do was to start a blog because, well, you know, I'm an introvert. And so I didn't want to join a writer's group. I thought I would make friends with readers instead of writers. And I start this blog and I give myself writing assignments every week. I, you know, this week I'm going to describe something hard to describe, or this week I'm going to write something meant to be humorous. You know, I would give myself writing assignments. So what's great about this from a, the standpoint of being a trainer is, um, you know, I always believe when I listen to trainers, when I go to clinics, I'm always hoping to hear a different set of words so that my understanding will shift a little um, I don't think that there's a whole lot of brand new information out there, but um, sometimes just hearing things a little bit differently will shift everything. Certainly. So, so writing, uh, you know, it would happen in a journal if I had journaled it. Journaling's good for figuring out your thoughts. So there I was writing and writing and writing. And, you know, to be clear, for the first two years, I think maybe 22 people followed my blog. And I could tell if somebody skipped reading and nobody commented. Uh-huh. And um, I stuck to it with that same uh, commitment I take to writing because writing and writing are very similar pastimes. And um, the thing that's been so great now, eight years in, posting twice a week and meeting all my deadlines is, I, I you know, I think I have deepened my understanding of what I teach, as weird as that sounds. Um, But, you know, I think that that's what Ray Hunt was saying in a different sort of context, but he was saying, you know, it takes a lifetime to figure this out. For me, the activity of writing about it has been really good. And so, Patrick, I bet you read a lot of articles. I do, yes. And I bet some of them are just stupefyingly dull. <laughs> I, I will admit. Yeah, I read those articles, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I read those reports that come out of college, you know, vet colleges and stuff like that. And, and I read them because I'm a trainer, and it's my job to be educated and to stay up to date. Mm, yes. And 
uh, there is so much writing out there that is hard to be interested in reading that this commitment to find a way to say things that was that would hold someone's attention um, became really important to me, you know, because I have the same aversion training you do. I read things that are very important to read and understand, um, but they're just dull. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I live on a little farm out on the prairie, and it's very quiet here, and so I took up writing, and it's just the smartest thing I ever did. That's fantastic. And now with this, uh, with this mindset about riding, did I see correctly that you actually teach a clinic? Most of us when we're in, in horses and we think about clinics, we're thinking about horsemanship clinics, but you also teach a clinic of sorts for writers? You know, I, I, well, I'm, I'm going to just take a moment out here to explain my business plan to you. Okay. Because, you know, I'm all about business. <laughs> this is my business plan. I say yes. That's it. <laughs> That's a good plan. <laughs> and yeah, it's working really well for me. <laughs> and so uh, somebody asked me to, and then somebody else asked me to. Uh -huh. And so far, three clinics have said, would you consider doing this? And so we do it either right before the clinic or right after the clinic. And the people who come to the writing workshop, uh, sometimes they're writers and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they don't have horses in their lives. And sometimes uh, it's a professional who would like to do more, write more effectively. Uh, sometimes it's storytelling. Sometimes it's memoir. Um, you know, I think it's really important that our voices are heard. And the thing I have to say is I, the people who come are really wonderful. And we end up having... You know, it's like a clinic. We end up coming away really ex inspired and really excited about what we're doing. And um, it, it, it's been really fun for me. That's fantastic. Those are the best ones, aren't they? Where it's just as much fun for you as it is for the participants. Oh, you know, um, I don't know how long you've been traveling, but I've been really fortunate. Uh, these last two years, I've traveled a lot. And... Um, it's great because you get to meet so many more horses and your understanding as a trainer deepens. You get to meet so many fascinating people. And, um, you know, I remember a long time ago, it dawned on me, um, <clears throat> long before I was a professional, it dawned on me that I thought some horse trainers um, really got along with people better than horses. Some got along with horses better than people. And as time went on, I decided, you know, uh, the people thing was going to be hard, but I'd work on it. Horses mm -hmm. were easy. And I have to say, it, it, the people I meet, I fall in love with. And, you know, I think about them when I'm gone. At the end of a, I start the clinic, I wrote, wrote it this way. I always feel like the new kid in school at the first day of a clinic. And, mm -hmm. you know, comes time to leave. And I am really sad. Yeah. That's you fantastic. know, it's a great experience to get to travel and meet horses and their riders and see how people do it in other places. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and it's, it's interesting, and I'm kind of glad that you brought that up, the idea about some people are better with horses and some people are better with the humans. But, you know, whether it's horses or humans, I find they're all individuals on their own path, and it's our job as an educator to reach those individuals, regardless of the body they happen to be in. So true. Yeah. Perfectly stated. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> I think at a certain point uh, in my life I drew sides, maybe. Not mm -hmm. in a black and white way, but, you know, uh, I think I, I agree with you. The more I'm around people and horses, Everybody is an individual, and the relationships that the two of them have are very individual relationships. Mm, yes. Um, yes. It's, it's one of the things that's so, you know, fascinating about this work that you and I do. It's, um, you know, the thing I love the most about it is that it's almost like an adrenaline sport, that you, you go someplace you don't know, and every hour of the day you meet somebody, two people, one in a horse suit, 
who are brand new to you. And, you know, I love the challenge of, of getting to do that. I just, I, you know, it's, it really energizes me and I'm really fascinated by it. Absolutely, absolutely. And the energizing thing I think is really neat too. I find it could be, uh, could be a full day of teaching. Well, you know, I'll take yesterday, for example, for me, um, I started teaching and working at 9 a.m. and I finished with a lecture at about 9.30 p.m. and I went solid through the whole day. And boy, if we would have had more lessons or we would have had another hour's worth of questions, I would have been just as excited to be there through the end of that. Um, yeah. And, yeah last, and I didn't have a whole lot of coffee. Standing. That's actually. our job. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, um, you know, and if you know if you don't feel that way, get out of the get out of the job. Yeah. But you know, it's it's inspiring to me. It's really, um, you know, it's all I like to do. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And that's you know, people ask me why do you do this. I say, gosh, because I couldn't see myself really doing much else. Um. <laughs> Well, that and just being ridiculously lucky, I think that adds in, too. Yeah, and, and I think know. there's there's a little pinch of stubbornness, too, maybe, sometimes. Oh, 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 <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, my first horse as an adult after I left home was an Appaloosa. And, of course, I heard all of the Appaloosa jokes. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I used to just take a little smile to my face and say, careful, takes one to ride one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, that's what I think. I think you have to be, you know, a little bit Appaloosa to survive in this world, uh, a little bit of uh, in this training world. I think having a little donkey in you isn't a bad thing. Uh, a little Arabian for that uh, last burst of energy at <laughs> night. That's a good yes. idea. Yes, yes. I love it. I, I love that you brought up Donkey because I also noticed on your website you mention Edgar Rice Burrow as a moral compass. Well, he is. <laughs> um, he is. He is better than all of us. Ah, uh, you know, I I tell everybody, and and people might actually get sick of hearing me mush over them and gush over them, but I absolutely love donkeys and mules, and and uh, so when I saw Edgar Rice Burrow, I I knew we were going to be friends, Anna. I knew it as soon as I read that. <laughs> well, and you know, just this week I was trying to round up some photographs that I had to send off. Uh, for PR for something, and so I'm looking for, you know, shots of me that I wouldn't mind having the world see, and I just love having my picture taken. That's an affirmation, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I found this great uh, photograph of Edgar and I doing horse agility, doing a teeter-totter. Oh, and nice. I thought, nah, you probably shouldn't send that one off. <laughs> and, um, yeah, uh, I tell my friends, you know, dressage training friends, if you really believe that you're a positive trainer, if you really think you've got that going for you, do a donkey. Train yep. them to do anything. Yep. Because, you know, that's, uh, that's where, that's the separators between, and the separator between the, the positive training, no, I mean it, positive, or I have to go sit in the house and wait for a while now. And, um, you know, you shouldn't use a vet that can't work with a donkey, and you shouldn't sure. use a farrier that doesn't have a donkey skill in him. Right. Um, uh, Edgar has a great sense of humor, but the reason he's our moral compass, um, <clears throat> I've worked a lot uh, with rescue horses over the years. Okay. I've always been, you know, on the on the list with a couple of local rescues here and uh, when a horse comes here you know they're usually not at their best if for no other reason than they you know just had a trailer ride and usually more mm -hmm. and I don't put them in with my herd and I don't want to isolate them so Edgar goes in with mm. the visitor and uh, no matter how much the new horse pushes him away. He doesn't get mad, and he doesn't kick back. 
and he'll share his food and he will be relentlessly pleasant. And so, yeah, he's my moral compass. That's fantastic. <laughs> Everyone needs an Edgar. <laughs> God, it's just true. It's just true. That's awesome. That is awesome. So you teach uh, clinics. I, I saw on your website you have several different clinics listed. Uh, and you also have an interesting thing listed there that you call concept clinics. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, well, you know, I would like to say that it's, a, it's just this genius idea that I came up with. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right to giggle there. You know, sometimes the way it goes in a lesson or in a clinic is that we start with one point and then we wander and we wander and we wander. And then uh, it's like we get a little bit, a, a snippet of information about a few different things. And my fantasy was that what I would do is a clinic that was all about one thing. And so I would just return to that topic again and again. So it would be like a spotlight on one thing. But as we go through the day and we work with individual humans and individual horses, uh, we get different perceptions of, of that. Um, and frankly, it's kind of a, a thing that, that we used to do in the art world back in the 80s and 90s where we would explore something fully, some concept fully um, in a piece of art or in a series of artwork. And so um, that's what I decided to do. Uh, and and it, with my usual flair for good business practice, um, I just scribbled something down on my blog. I hadn't updated my clinic web uh, page for years, and I've always given clinics, um, you know, sometimes three a year. And, okay. and so I write this draft about concept clinics, and I don't do the spell check, and I just hit draft and go to bed. I think you know what happened. Uh-oh. That wasn't the draft yeah. button you hit, huh? It, no. No, and I woke up in the morning with people with emails that said, "Oh, this sounds great." And so I went ahead and did the spell check, and you know, put a photograph in, and it acted like I meant to do it all along. Um, <laughs> roll, with, just roll with it. I'm trying to act like it was my plan. I'm just trying to say, yeah, yeah, yes, I did that. Yes, it's a genius idea. Yes. <laughs> and um, they've been really fun to do, really fun. So how do they work? Uh, well, you know, to explain it in the context that you and, I, you and I probably understand, and I would hope that people listening would understand, is, um, you know, you would go to a clinic maybe, and um, uh, the first rider was an intro level rider and her walk trot transitions were where you'd be. Or, and then the second rider might be a fourth level rider and the third, you know, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, it's funny, I hadn't connected this uh, until right now. One of my early clinics was with Sandy Fluger years and years and years ago. And I was about the first ride of the day, and there were a bunch of upper-level riders coming, and I was a baby. And um, uh, I got out there, and she started us walking, and uh, it was great. It was a great lesson. And I looked at my watch 20 minutes in, and I was still walking. And time went on, and I was still walking. Still walking, still walking, 45 minutes in, still walking. It's the best walk of my entire riding career, but I felt like quite a loser. Yeah. Um, how pathetic I must be. Mm, right, that right. She, she, she would not let me out of the walk. And at the end of the hour, I climbed down and hung my head. And she asked me if my horse was for sale, but I knew she didn't mean it. She just felt sorry for me, so I didn't even answer her. I stumbled, put my horse up watered him, give him hay, and I thought, you know, I'll come back in and watch what the real riders get to do. Mm. <laughs> and nobody got out of the walk that day. Yep. Nobody. Yep. And 
in hindsight, I guess it was a concept clinic. I guess she had something, you know, she didn't advertise it that way. And I don't know how many people would have come if they'd known they weren't going to get out of the walk. Yeah. But it was a concept clinic that she was, she had a bit of information she wanted to impart in such a clear way. And that's the way I feel about these clinics is I just, I just want to do this one thing really well so that everybody understands it on a bunch of different levels in a bunch of different scenarios. Mm, okay. Okay. Wow. So there's That's still rider, riders are still coming out and bringing their horses uh, Absolutely. to them. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Very Absolutely. Interesting. And um, so, you know, if the clinic, um, one of them is called Dressage Rhymes with Massage. Mm hmm. And regardless of what breed you ride or your level of, uh, you know, level of riding skill, um, you know, if you're going to ride in the arena, the horse has to feel good. Yes. And uh, the warm-up is really crucial for that. Um, I want my horses to pull to go to the arena. I want them so happy in the arena because everything good happens there. And so... Some of that has to do with a warm-up that encourages the horse to physically feel good, mm -hmm. but also mentally be engaged. And so that's a great example of something I can do with any rider and any horse at the level they're at, whatever breed they are. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And it would look, and the lesson would look different all day long. Sure. Depending depending on the individuals. So that's what it's like. Interesting. Okay, so you have uh, dressage rhymes with massage, uh, and I noticed also you have one called holding hands with horses. How does that one work? <laughs> well, boy. Well, you know, that one has to do with contact. That's uh, kind of what I thought. Uh, I like that. Yeah, and um, i got to say, is there... Anything harder to teach than that? Do you know of anything harder to teach than contact? Um, astrophysics might be a little more difficult, but I don't know. I've not learned that one to even try to teach it myself. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I might have more problem with any math class. But, uh, <laughs> yep. with, yeah, with horses, I think, I think the ideal understanding of contact is really challenging. Yes. And that's why we have so many opinions about riders and their hands. It's because it's really hard to learn. Yes. And so this is a clinic where we do um, some exercises with each other and other exercises with the horse and just really try and um, proceed into the idea of contact a little more creatively. Mm. And so we always use this term. We say writing is an art. Yes. Well, it's literally I, I take that very literally. Um, you know, it's what I've done my whole life. When I closed down my gallery and uh, went full-time to training, I told my clients that I had changed media because I find uh, working with horses to be by far the most creative thing I've done in my life. And contact is one of those things that I just think involves a whole lot more than take a death grip on the reins and kick hard. And, you know, it is a, a dance of finesse. And so that clinic is about that. And it's about perceiving it in a different way. But it's also some physical exercises that give us a better understanding of uh, what it feels like to the horse. And, um, you know, if there is a fundamental aspect to everything I teach, it's that we have to see it from their side. Mm, yes, absolutely. So how would you define connection? Well, first of all, it has to be totally rhythmic. Everything good that happens for a horse happens rhythmically. Chewing, grazing, walking. Everything bad that happens for a horse happens with a break of rhythm, bucking, mm -hmm. bolting, spooking. Mm -hmm. So my hands must maintain rhythm with the movement of my horse. Other than that, it's really easy. 
<laughs> sure. Oh yeah, you know that's all, and then and then it's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's what's so complicated about it. Yeah. Um, and we have a tendency, some of us punish with the reins uh, consciously. Some of us punish with the reins unconsciously. Um, here's the dilemma with contact, in my opinion. Horses, they're flight animals. Uh, you think now I'm going to say that humans are predators, but it's even worse than that, weirder than that. <laughs> okay. We're primates. Yeah. We, we swing by our hands. Mm -hmm. Everything we do, we do with our hands. When babies are born, we stick our little finger out and ask them to grab it. Um, we have been grabbing, pulling, and holding things our you know, it's innate. It is our instinct. Absolutely. And we're tool using primates, no less. So we use other things to get the job done. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, truthfully, uh, we're a bad match with horses. It's just that we're not giving them up. And I don't think they're giving us up either. Right. And so, you know, we have to figure out how to get past our own instinct. And that's the tricky part. We always want horses to lay down their instinct for us, but we're not particularly uh, interested in laying down our instinct for them. Um, you know, I think, I, I, you know, it's like a, a Zen journey to learn good contact. So absolutely well put. Um, the, the idea of us laying down our instinct is so true because we have our natural tendencies for you know going fetal and gripping and grasping um, and yeah. that that Zen journey that's that that I think sums up horsemanship doesn't it right there yeah well and you know that's why it's an art if all it all that mattered was a technique well, that would be a different thing entirely you know techniques I was gonna say were easy to learn like math, but again, something that <laughs> evaded me, so it's a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I think uh, it is innate within us to want to control our environment. Yes. And, um, you know, you just never get to control a horse. You right. just don't. Right, exactly. I find we're all... Uh, and I, of course, I I joke about this, but I, I say that all riders are uh, are that type A personality uh, because we're trying to control that whole situation. And the fact is, we're trying to control another living being's entire existence, which I think kind of makes us type A squared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And most of us are also introverts, so we're type A introverts, which means that we stew about it a lot. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, uh, I have come to this way of training um, in, a, in a way that uh, was about the last thing I expected. Um, you know, I got into dressage and I started to see the upper level movements. And, you know, I did not own dressage horses. I didn't, I owned backyard horses. Mm -hmm. And I had a dream and I really wanted to ride up the levels. And I was very ambitious about it. I just wanted it so badly. Mm -hmm. Think type A. Mm -hmm. And um, it was great. Uh, it was wonderful. I just had to change everything about myself. Yep. How you get to upper level is you change everything about yourself. Right. So in my, how I came to train with the positive methods I use uh, was through blind ambition that went wrong. <laughs> 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 the, the, you know, I got hung up. I got yeah. hung up, and I—you get to that place where I'll just do anything to get it right. Yes. And doing anything meant I had to change. Right. I had to teach myself to act like I didn't care. I had to teach myself to laugh out loud. And this one's a huge one with me because, um, you know, 
horses can't learn if they are stuck in their flight or fight mode and I can't uh, learn anything if I'm tense and stressed out. Right. Um, I certainly can't teach someone, horse or human, in that state. And uh, horses like us when we laugh. So, you know, step A should be to learn to laugh when you're on your horse. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Breathing is optional, but laughing should be a must. <laughs> well, you know, laughter is a way of breathing. I, I want to think of it that way. <laughs> yes, yes, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Well, I think it would it would get us to breathe in maybe even a more meaningful way, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, um, uh, for humans, laughter is a huge relief. Uh, for us, it, um, you know, it changes our nervous system. It's a shift in our nervous system. Yes. And, you know... I don't care how the shift begins. I just care that we get to a place where we're kind of unstuck and open and, you know, not having any more stress than we absolutely need to have. Yes, the fact that it happens is the important part. How we get there is a little less important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, um, I think I think if horses had a choice, laughing is what they'd want from us. Mm. Um, I think they seem to like it. That's I think very they have a pretty good sense of humor themselves, but, you know, again, if you're not laughing, you wouldn't recognize your behavior as a sense of humor. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes, oh, this is so true. This is so true. Yeah, that's interesting. So we kind of touched a little bit there on, on what we w- could refer to as the, the sympathetic state of the nervous system there with horses and with people. Um, and, and that's going to actually take me to my next point here and something I'm super interested in chatting with you about. Um, and that's your concept clinic about the calming signals. Uh, can you, you know, tell me I about those? Said it, yeah, I almost said it a minute ago and I choked it back. Uh, laughing is a calming signal yes. that a human gives when we are telling people you know, to relax, that uh, we don't mean them any harm, that, you know, hmm. uh, a, a calming signal. Uh, it's a phrase. Do you, are you familiar where the phrase came from? No, I'm not at all, actually. Well, it was coined in 2005, I think, by a woman uh, who's a dog trainer, a Norwegian dog trainer whose name is Tura Drugas, and she wrote a book uh, entitled On Talking Terms with Dogs, colon, Calming Signals. Mm. And she gave that term to body language that dogs have that, as a way of communicating with each other. And it's a puny little book with a whole lot of photographs in it. I really recommend it. And um, It sounds right I, up my alley. Puny little book with lots of pictures. Well, you know, again... I'm fussy about what I read. I thought I could get through it. But um, it came not long after I moved out here to the farm and everything kind of came apart. And I also uh, had a rescue dog at that point. And so um, I got this dog in hopes, or this book in hopes of helping the dog. But as I read it, I really felt like it, it was everything my dogs and horses were doing were the same. So I move out here and I'm all alone and uh, I've got two horses and two dogs and I don't know anybody. So I do what any reasonable person would do. I got some llamas and goats. And what I noticed was they were all having a conversation that I was not involved in. And theoretically, you know, these are upper level horses. Judges tell me that I ride happy horses. I think things are just great, Mm. but I'm left out of the conversation. And um, I wrote a blog about it because that's what I do. I write blogs about things. And uh, I gave her credit for it. But I really connected with what she had to say in this book. And as I started to relate to the horses in those terms, everything changed in a way that shocked me, especially at that point in my horse life. Mm. Um, 
And so I wrote this blog, and it went viral, and I was really flattered because back in those days, you know, I had fewer readers than I do now. And, and a week after the blog came out, I got an email from Turid Rugas, and I was nervous when I got it. I thought, oh, gee, I hope, you know, <laughs> did I screw this up? Oh, sure, and, sure, yeah. Yeah, and um, I didn't screw it up. She said, thank you so much. I was hoping people would relate this to horses. She said that she grew up on a horse farm. She trained dogs now. Um, a, a student of hers published a book last summer um, that relates it to horses, and I don't have that title in front of me, but I'd be happy to post it on your website later. It's a great thank book you. about calming signals in horses. Okay. It's a bigger book, but there are still lots of pictures. And the reason the pictures matter is because this is a visual language. It's not an auditory language. Yeah. And um, uh, it just became so much a part of how I relate to animals this last uh, 20 years of living on the farm and, and um, training this way. And... Uh, yeah, it changed everything. So a calming signal, just to be clear, um, is a signal that a horse gives a human because we are a loud, warlike species uh, who lacks, sometimes lack polite manners. <laughs> mm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so the calming clinics are, yeah, calming signal clinics um, for me, my experience of them is they get better and better and better because the horses teach me more and more and more. Um, so they're really the high point of my of my life right now. I really enjoy giving them because you know we go some places, stand around and listen to horses all weekend. Mm, yeah. Oh, I love that. I love the way that you said that. I love the thought of that. I feel like that's what I do every day. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have one of my favorite thank you cards from a little barn in Adelaide, uh, Australia. Uh, they gave me a thank you card that said, thank you for traveling 8,000 miles to stand around and breathe. <laughs> 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 and, you know, it's like, yeah, um, everybody understands the concept that less is more. Mm -hmm. But nobody actually knows what less is. Apparently, right. Everybody believes that they're patient, um, but maybe not so much. And so I feel like it's part of my job, you know, to demonstrate what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's fantastic. So when we're talking about these signals that the horse gives to us humans, um, what what do those signals look like? What are we actually looking at or looking for? Um. Well, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of one that I think we've all seen. Uh, foals have a particular chanting um, movement that they do with their mouths. Mm. It's not like anything else. Mm -hmm. So they're standing next to their moms, and another horse walks by, and the little foal champs. Yes. And then the other horse walks on by. And that's the full saying, I'm no threat to you, you know, mm -hmm. peace, 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 <laughs> peace <right>. baby. <laughs> and, um, and so, I, you know, things as common as that. So calming signals, uh, this is a new term, but it's things we're incredibly familiar with. So uh, that's one that everybody has seen, and I think because it goes on between horses and horses, it's understandable. Uh, yeah. um, another calming signal is for a horse to look away. And so you'll see this happen a lot um, if you walk up with a halter. Perhaps the horse will look away. And I think some of us have been taught then that the horse is being disrespectful. Right. Or that uh, the horse, uh, you know, is bored or, you know, mm -hmm. some something. Mm -hmm. um, it's this crazy thing. He just looked away. If you take a breath, he'll bring his head back. Mm -hmm. Looking away is just his way of saying, um, a little slower, mm -hmm. I just need a moment. Right, hang on, let me have a moment, yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you 
allow him that moment and allow him to volunteer to get his halter on, um, you, you know, it makes a huge difference to a horse. Uh, I used to not know that. I think it's one of the biggest things I've learned giving this clinic. Um, I, when I made my presentation, I, I used the example of haltering horses. So I have a bunch of videos in my presentation of different horses being haltered and what they have to say. And of course, it's not about haltering, it's about what they have to say. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's it's really fascinating. It's they're all individuals. It's exactly what you said earlier. Um, the reason I have come to believe that it's so important is what I hear from people later. Um, you know, I've gone, I've done this at therapeutic riding programs and at private barns and, you know, all kinds of different places and all kinds of different areas. And, you know, I think it boils down to confidence that horses get overhandled, especially their heads, and that they learn a version to one degree or another mm -hmm. of learned helplessness. And if you begin to give them choices, um, it, you know, the world changes. Yeah. Yeah. That learned helplessness and that aversion, that's, that's very interesting. I, I often find myself referring to the horse's personal philosophy about us and the things we ask of him. Uh, and, and I'm kind of, as I'm listening to this, I feel like we're thinking about the same things or similar things in those moments. What would you call a horse's personal philosophy? Uh, well, I had, for instance, uh, I was working with a student today. Um, we were filming an in-hand course, and one of the big pieces that we work toward is a, an extension and a softening of the horse's top line. And uh, she was asking, uh, my student was asking her horse to soften through the body and extend the top line just through a little contact with the nose band of the halter. So it's not in a pushing way downward of the head or pulling forward. It's a soft, simple invitation. And the mare's philosophy to that initial contact was to brace. And we waited for no less than 30 minutes with the contact, exactly the same, until the release came through. And you, you talked earlier about softness and patience. You know, I, I tell riders there's four big keys, and that's slower, softer, wait, and breathe. And it, it was... It was really interesting to watch the human go through this process because we wanted to do a little more. We wanted to add a little more. We wanted to hurry it up oh, a little God. bit. We wanted to get Escalate it done. Escalate that cue, baby. Yeah, exactly. The escalation of the cue, right? If if you know they don't get the question right, we add a little more pressure, uh, which in essence then we're changing the question just because they got the answer wrong. I think, um, but you well, know, yeah, so and I think that when we escalate the pressure what we actually end up training them is to not think. Yes. In other words, I think the horse is thinking about what it is. Yes. But then we up the cue, and, yes. and what they learn is don't think. So, yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. And, uh, and it was interesting because this student, she does present herself in a very soft way just maybe not soft enough for this particular horse. And she mentioned that when she rides her, she spends the first 10 or 15 minutes in a really braced frame, and then she begins to soften, and it doesn't take anything for her to go back to braced. And it was pretty evident in the way that she would change her posture when a contact, even with a hand on the halter, was taken, the the upper neck would contract. You know, the top line muscles coming into a slight contraction, and it was slight. It wasn't a lot. It was it was very slight. So I give her that. Uh, but it, that contraction was there. You know, um, and and I think of that as the horse's philosophy, right? They learn. Yeah. Oh, contact! I need to brace to prepare for that contact. Or similar to what you're saying about the yeah. horse turning the head away. I need another minute. Give me a minute here to deal with this. Yeah. So you know, yeah. Well, and she has, that mare has an entire history of everything. Yes. Um, everything that's ever happened to her. Yes, yes. 
and you know, um, I, you know, I kind of think they live all moments in time at the same time, meaning, uh, you know, you, 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 you never get to start with a clean slate with a horse. Never. Right. Um, even babies have, you know, exper- heard experiences, um, and it's all right there. Right. And, well, <laughs> because they've got a whole other world that's outside of us. Well, yeah, and I mean, I think sometimes, depending on, you know, mm-hmm. our habit, and it's not, I don't even think it's a philosophy with us, I think it's an instinct, we escalate, it's what we do. Yes. Um, and half the time we're not even aware that we do it. Um, but I think for some horses, you have to prove to them that you're not going to do whatever it is their philosophy of what comes next is. And, you know, sometimes that takes time. Sometimes horses let go of it, you know, in a minute. Yes. And sometimes not. Right, right, right. Absolutely. And it can be amazing sometimes the the large aversions uh, or the flamboyant aversions that I see that horses offer that in moments they'll let go of them. Or like with this mare today, very mild aversion that, boy, she took a long time to let go of. So what I would say about that, just, you know, and I'm not there, so I can't say anything. Um, One of the reasons to learn calming signals is that, uh, you know, I don't think anybody has a hard time understanding what's going on uh, when that chestnut mare pins her ears so hard to her neck that she leaves divots in the hair. Right. Um, but boy, it would be good if we could have some conversation before that. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, reactive horses, uh, in a sense, are a little easier to work with mm-hmm. because it's right there. Yes, it's um, much more clear. For, yeah, for really stoic, quiet horses, um, we have to learn to read really, really tiny, tiny signs because that's how they communicate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I listen to you talk about this mirror that you worked with today, um, that's what I think. I think that she was expressing very, very tiny things in the language of calming signals. Um, you know, there was a moment where uh, maybe she blinked her eye differently. Mm-hmm. And in that instance, I would exhale because that would be, you know, a way of telling her that was a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, some horses like verbal, some don't. But, you know, for these, what people always say about stoic horses is um, that they hold a grudge or that they're fine. They're just perfect. They're push button horses. He just came apart for no reason. Yeah, yeah, uh, horses, right. Yeah, they don't come apart for no reason. You just haven't been listening. And, you know, one of the reasons to, you know, really kind of get more involved with what horses are telling us with their bodies um, is is just exactly that, that, you know, mares like her, um, you know, she's that kind of horse that I... I wouldn't think haltering differently would make a difference. And I also, there's a a leading exercise that I teach in my calming signals clinics. And I teach it because it's really fun for horses and hard for people. And um, we we learn a lot from it. And again, uh, in hindsight, I keep hearing of horses who's, fundamental behaviors seem to switch <clears throat> by haltering them differently. And that seems crazy to me. Um, but, you know, I hear it enough now. I certainly see it in my horses here and the horses I work with, you know, locally. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, it's that thing. I think as we try to understand horses, there are some things that are very similar between humans and horses. And then there are other things that mean the exact opposite. And uh, it can be hard sometimes to figure out uh, which is which. Um, You know, for whatever reason, that mare is uh, holding uh, her own best counsel. Yes, yes. 
and uh, she has, you know, I don't think it's brand new, probably. Did you think right. it was brand new? No, no, definitely not, definitely not. And this is a, a horse I've, I've seen previously. I worked with this gal and her horse at one point before, and we worked very much the entire time uh, then also on releasing and relaxing the top line. This is definitely uh, something that has been layered in, and we're working to layer it out you know, uh, just yeah. the same. Because I don't think you can, with, with one of those things that's been layered in over time, I don't think you can just snap your fingers. And I could be wrong. Maybe maybe I'll find a horse that that's possible with. But I think that would be the, the rare case um, that you can just, you know, wave your magic wand and all that resistance or all that, that uh, holding best counsel, I like how you said that, uh, just goes away. You know, again, I do some work in the rescue world. And... Mm. Uh, I, I am, it is a bittersweet thing to rescue a horse, and I think uh, rescue horses tug on our heartstrings. And uh, some horses go to rescue just out of neglect. No harm, no foul, they're fine. They're, you know, no issues. Right. Um, some of them, you know, come with a lot of baggage, and I think uh, we are wrong to think that we can heal those horses. Uh, they can heal themselves over time, but we certainly can't heal them. And when I first started riding, somebody at my barn said, um, you know, as an adult riding after I left home, and so uh, I bring this, you know, unstarted uh, three-year-old to a boarding barn, and I'm listening to a barn conversation, and the woman speaking says that it's like having a bank account, that a horse has a bank account of all of their experiences, and then the rider has that same bank account, and so what's great about it is, uh, you know, uh, when you're not quite okay, your horse uh, can take something out of his account and offer to help you, and vice versa. And it just sounded, you know, romantic to me. Yes. Right up until it dawned on me that I had no bank account and neither did my horse. <laughs> we were, well, that's because we, we own took, horses and that's just the way it goes. When you own horses, you have no real bank account anyway. Well, it, yeah, of any kind. <laughs> right. Of any, of any kind at all. And, um, it, you know, I think that uh, horses come with this baggage and it's like a bank account of whatever experience they've had, but it's probably not good. Mm, yeah, and yeah. we want to think that we could just start a new bank account. Well, first off, we want to think we could just close down the bad account, and we can't, right. ever. Those memories will be there forever. We cannot change them. Right. Uh, right. We can try to build up a new bank account, but it might take five times as much. Yeah, you know, it might take whatever, and I think that that's what you're talking about with this mayor. Hmm. Um, the, two, the three of you are working together to make positive deposits in that mayor's bank account, and she's the one who gets to decide when it's enough. Yes, and, and just like a bank account that's gone backwards, sometimes it takes a long time to, to build it up out of the negative, right? Yeah, yeah, and, you know, her... That, I always say this about training. Um, uh, I think we get to decide what we're going to do, but the horse gets to decide when. Um, sometimes that's a really exciting concept, and sometimes it's a pretty depressing concept. <laughs> um, but, you know, she's, she's going to decide when she feels that she can relax around us. And, you know, I'm just going to keep breathing until she feels like uh, she can do it. Yes. And, you know, the flip side of this, for everybody who's got young horses and for everybody whose horses don't have any issues, what should be really clear is that bad experiences last forever. So, uh, you know, I always ask mm -hmm. people in my clinics, um, uh, did they did they have a bad experience in their childhood? Well, of course, everybody has, and they remember it. Sometimes I ask if there was a bully, and they always know the bully's name, always. Yes. So these are people who are maybe 50, 60 years old who remember the name of a kid in grade school who was a bully. Right. That's why, and horses remember the exact same way. Mm -hmm. It's like, first, do no harm. If You know, if you are... A, dominating rider 
understand that you are depositing in a bank account that you do not want to have become the dominant conversation between the two of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that makes that makes a lot of sense, and, and you're so right because it's it, just as people have it, horses have it, and it goes from the time they were born. You know. Um, yeah. And it could be something that had nothing to do with people in that moment. It could be, you know, a moment in the paddock where they felt claustrophobic, they felt squished between two other horses or something like that that ends up causing something that comes back uh, in a riding situation. Um, Absolutely. And that's why, you know, we should, humans love to take things personally. We sure but do. That's why we can't take it personally. Yes. Um, you know, people love to tell the horror story of what they think happened. Um, and, in, you know, with all of the horses that have come through my barn, um, it really doesn't matter if they were abused or not. It matters if they think they were. And it doesn't matter who the culprit was. It might have been, uh, you know, maybe a boss mare that was a little aggressive in her approach, you know, that mm -hmm. just created a, you know, just kind of a, an atmosphere that was frightening yes. all the time. And so, again, it's a loss, of, it, I could call it a loss of confidence. Maybe they never had confidence, but confidence is about the only thing a horse needs to learn, first, foremost, and always. And so, you know, this thing of giving them a choice, uh, it's really... Um, inspiring. So I got to take a picture in my arena with a horse and rider I was working with yesterday. And he's a young horse that's boarded here. She's new with him. Uh, he came last fall. And he's, um, oh, he's a percher on Thoroughbred Cross. He's huge. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he's tiny. I think you know what I mean. Ah, yes. He's, he furrows his brow. He's over 17 hands. He furrows his brow, and he's tiny. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing this exercise where we lead from behind. So it's kind of like ground driving with one line. Okay. That's an oversimplification, but it's the horse's choice. The horse goes first. The horse takes us for a walk. Um, and I live on a dirt road, and the grader, road grader came down. And I got to take a photograph of this young horse who's learning about confidence from leading from behind as he marched with his ears up towards the road grader mm. while, uh, you know, the yeah. woman handling him followed. And, you know, it was just such a proud moment. He was afraid of his own shadow. Yeah, when what he a came. feat. What a feat. Yeah, and, you know, my mentor taught me that uh, curiosity is a sign of courage in a horse. And um, he's getting really brave, and it's just so much fun to watch. That's great. It, seeing that, that process carry out and that confidence develop is such an awesome experience. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can't make it happen, but you can let it happen. Right. You can you, you can, can egg it on. Set it up. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you can egg it on. And that's <laughs> what I want to do. I want to egg it on. I want to be, you know, with my breath cheering, with my body supporting, you know, from a standpoint of standing, you know, with both my feet on the ground and breathing and, you know, being there at a distance. I want him to do it his own self. Yes. Yes. We, I, I found we can't rush confidence, we can't rush understanding, and we can't rush relaxation, but we can help them develop. <laughs> Relax, damn it! <laughs> yeah, right? Right? <laughs> Relax! I am relaxed! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's like, uh, you know, uh, what you were saying about Ray Hunt, and certainly what I think and what dressage masters, I think of Ray Hunt as a dressage master, I, I doubt he'd be a, uh, really flattered by that, but you know, it is always about 
getting it in our own selves first yes. and to really get have our own personal confidence at a level where we, where we can stand back and not do it for the horse um you know that's just huge for us yes yes that is so true that is so true. So, and, and hearing you talk about uh, the horses in this way, and I'm absolutely loving it because I feel like we're on the same page here. Um, it, it's, it's bringing up to mind a quote from a friend of mine. I don't know if you know Tom Curtin, um, but I, I overheard him say at a clinic once, and I think you probably might like this quote, and that's why I'm inspired to share it with you. Um, he was saying to a group of students, uh, he said, you know, it doesn't matter what I think of your horsemanship. It doesn't even really matter what you think of your horsemanship. But what matters is how your horse feels about himself when he's with you. Amen. Right? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Nuno Alvera said the only judge of a rider should be the horse. Exactly. And, you know, and I feel like... A, I've heard it in a million different ways, but that's it exactly. And, um, you know, that's, that's always what we, you know, sorry to drag this back to the whole uh, parable for life thing. No, I think but it's appropriate. It. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's it. We want to uh, hang with people who make us feel good about who we are. Um, I feel like it's part of my job as a clinician uh, to get people inspired about their horse. Um, and some of it is going to clinics where I've seen that not happen or I've had it not happen. Sure. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean, you know, just say sweet things all day long. But, you know, um, nobody who has horses is remotely passive about it. Uh, it's a passion for all of us. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, I think as a trainer and clinician, it's my job uh, to see the best and uh, magnify that in both horses and riders. Um, and, you know, for the challenging horses like the mare today, I think it takes, you know, it looks different sometimes. Yes, yes, that's very true. It, it looks different. It's a similar idea that takes many different forms. Yeah. 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 So you mentioned earlier a comment about a horse holding a grudge. Uh, and I hear so many people talk about, oh, this horse is stubborn. What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on a horse being stubborn or a horse holding a grudge? Well, you know who they say is stubborn? Donkeys. Donkeys, yeah. Yeah, donkeys aren't stubborn. They think we're rude. Mm. Yes, <laughs> I, would, I would buy that, absolutely. We're loud and fast. Um, uh, there is a, a horse that comes to my mind uh, in my training experience when I think of what you're, what I mean by holding a grudge. And, um, a, you know, uh, just a fabulously talented, beautiful horse. And what you see when you're standing on the ground next to her uh, to make a, a long story short, what you see standing on the ground next to her is that her flank looks like a six pack, that you can see every muscle mm. in her torso tense. Yeah. And she thinks something bad is going to happen, and mm -hmm. she had better brace her ribs for it. Um, she is holding her breath. Uh, it, it, she's rock hard. Mm -hmm. And it goes without saying her top line, too. Sure. But, y you know, she is holding a grudge that everything against humans. And um, I don't need to know how she got the grudge. Mm -hmm. But I need to, you know, I need to work with her until she gives it up. Yes, to help her let um, down. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, I guess I could say she was abused, but I would rather say she's holding a grudge, and yeah. it doesn't mean that she doesn't, the grudge isn't well-founded. Right, right. Um, you know, she has a bad opinion of humans. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, you, you know, 
I have no reason to think she didn't come by the grudge honestly. Yes. Um, I don't think she's being stubborn in that traditional definition of uh, distracted or not wanting to work with me or disrespectful. Mm -hmm. I think what she's saying is, you know, you and your kind, um, I can't trust you. Yeah, so when you're saying she's holding a grudge, that would be um, kind of the words I think that I would use for that was that she'd be taking it personal. Yeah. Uh, which, which is the same thing in, in different words. But yeah. Well, yeah. well, yeah, and um, you know, and we take it personal. I, you know, I come from a family that holds grudges, and so mm. the, the terminology it, it means a lot of different things to me in life. Uh -huh. I don't think it's necessarily. I, I mean, I don't. I'm not going to call it bad. Sure. Because right. she's protecting herself doing it. Yes, Ray would refer to that as self-preservation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, uh, what she has learned is uh, I better not trust. I better not. I'm not okay mm -hmm. here. I better not trust this. I better stay hollow. And just because I relax today, it does not mean anything. I'm, you, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's like she is afraid to show her vulnerable side. Yeah. And, um, boy, you know, that's fair. It sounds like that bank account is in a pretty large deficit. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and so, you know, I will say either, yeah, I'll say it sarcastically, you know, training horses is really easy, it's just an accumulation of good experiences. Yeah. And, and I mean, truly, I think that is it. Mm -hmm. The problem is, it's up to us to make it a good experience. Yeah, to create those experiences, sure. Yeah. Yeah, and um, it can be challenging enough with a young horse who comes with his particular, you know, chemistry of mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, you know, the thing we haven't talked about uh, is, you know, is the horse sound. Mm -hmm. And I hate having this conversation because I don't think many horses are sound, but... I also don't think we can figure out what's unsound about them as well as we would like to. Right. And so calming signals frequently tell us that they're in pain. Um, you know, it's huge for that. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, what's a good example of this? Um, well, this one's a personal one. Um, I got a young horse. I bought him when he was two months old. We did everything right. We waited to wean him. We did everything just right. Uh, he was 45 minutes away. I hauled the horse in a trailer to go get him. It, you know, he showed up here. He had a great day. And I called the breeder that night, and I said, we got home safe and found he's great. And she said, good. I'm, I'm glad. I won't worry. And I said, you never told me he was food aggressive. And I and she said to me, Well that's funny, he isn't wasn't that way here. And so I trained him to not be food aggressive. I did it kindly, mm -hmm. but I trained him to not be food aggressive. And what he was telling me was that he got an ulcer mm -hmm. uh, in the like the vast majority of horses that we haul to a new environment. And sure. and so you know, again, a calming signal is how they can tell us that they're in pain. But if we only hear it as a behavioral issue that needs to be corrected, well, you know, I'm going to bet that that experience happened to the mare you're talking about at some point where she said, this hurts. And the answer she got back was, you will do what I say mm. or something. It went on her. Yeah, but she associates then pain with um, humans. Mm -hmm. So how would we recognize uh, a horse giving these calming signals for pain? What would that look like? Um, you know, there are a bunch of pretty fascinating articles about it, but this would be my short version because I can't show you pictures right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see tense lines around their eyes. Mm, yes. uh, maybe their nostrils. And, You'll see a difference in their nostrils. Their mouth will be tense. Um, sometimes they'll uh, 
gesture to where they're uncomfortable, sometimes they'll just shut down. So a lot of times when a horse is in pain, their eyes will go blank and they'll shut down. In other words, it might look to us like they're ignoring us. Mm-hmm. So here's the problem with calming signals and talking about calming signals. Can you tell me uh, the definition of the word blue? Mm. Uh, gotcha, yes. When is later? <laughs> oh, when is later? You know, That's a good one. When is later? Yeah, or any of the other things your daughter asked you when she was younger. Yes, how far uh, is and, up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, if we take a tiny calming signal out of context, it could mean anything. Yes. We always have to continue the conversation and get an overall sense. Of, of what's going on. And then on top of that, as you know, this is where it gets really fun. Um, of course, horses are individuals. Mm-hmm. So some horses um, have very expressive ears, but their nose might be pretty quiet. Sometimes they'll be very expressive with their mouths um, and their ears will, will say less. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's all about their eyes. Um, and so it's just like you and I, have through this conversation passed ideas back and forth to try and decide, you know, what we're each saying and to find, you know, some connection between the things we're saying. It's the exact same way speaking, you know, listening and responding to horses' calming signals. We have to take them in context with everything. Yeah, yeah. So it's dynamic, contextual, and individual all at the same time. Yeah, other than that, it's really easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's just that easy. Yeah, just, <laughs> nothing more, not much more to it. <laughs> well, you know, the strange thing is, if you stand around and listen, they'll keep talking. Um, yeah. You know, it does, it does get clearer. You know, it's like any, it's like learning to lengthen and shorten your reins. You can get better at it and it's easier. Mm, yeah, yeah. And it, in the beginning, it feels like a ball of twine. Sure. And, well, you know, it's learning a new language. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's the language they speak. And, you know, for as much as, as much success and happiness I, as I had with horses before, I knew before I started thinking in these terms, I had nothing to complain about. Um, But our relationships have gotten so much more dimensional from here. And I am that person, you know. I don't think horses are mystical creatures sent here to heal us. I think if we learn something from them, it's our own good luck. I don't want them uh, to be subservient to me. I don't want them to be Zen masters for me. I kind of like them just the way they are. I want to understand them as horses rather than making them into something, you know, that suits a dialogue I want to have. I would rather listen to their dialogue because I got to tell you, it's pretty fascinating. Mm, Yes. And, And, you know, I think that we... For those of us who have that experience of having a horse for decades, um, by the time they get old, we we tend to forget how fractious they were as young horses. Um, I think it is always the journey that we take long term. Um, It can be a horse that you have owned for a long time, or it could be, you know, I think that's when I see people doing long treks on their horses. I think by the end of the trick, they know a lot more about their horse than they did when they started. <laughs> yes. And the same thing is true riding up the levels of dressage. It is a journey up those levels, and you will forge a relationship or you won't be able to proceed. Right. And, um, you know, it's not going to be whatever it is you thought it was. And then at the end, uh, you know, we know each other so well that we just beat with the same heart, but it never starts that way. Um, You know, I think understanding calming signals makes that process a little easier. 
it, you know, it doesn't feel as random or accidental. Right, right. Well, it sounds like it gives us um, a better understanding of the messages coming across. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which are frequently not what we want to hear. Sure. You know, that has to be okay. Sure, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I always say... Uh, you know, if you take a breath and you're trying to decide what your horse is, um, you know, trying to say to you, and the message you get is that they would like a blue velvet pad, that's you. That's not your horse. <laughs> but if you take a nice breath and the message you get is your hands suck, <laughs> well, that's probably I the horse. Think, I think and you probably should listen to that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and the reason it matters is one day the message is going to come loud and clear. Uh, your horse is going to show you grace at some time that you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a direct result of this. Right. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't start that way on day one. It has to grow to that. And um, if you can be speaking the same language along the way... Uh, you know, it's a real asset. If you're working with a troubled horse, it's a real asset to at least understand. You'll be able to see that they're thinking about it. And boy, whenever I can see that a horse is reasoning something out, that's huge for me. I really want to reward that. I want a horse that thinks. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So how do we help riders to recognize these things? How do we help riders to see when the horse is trying or when the horse is thinking or like you're talking about these calming signals? How do we help the riders to recognize those? And even more so, when they're on their back. Well, that's what's fun about the calming signals clinic because we spend this, the first day is usually on the ground and then the second day is on their back. Um, okay through this lens, through this new calming signals lens where we're just looking at behaviors that we've all seen forever, um, but actually giving them, uh, you know, the weight they deserve. Well, geez, a lot of conversations go on at the mounting block, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> Starts yes. right there. Uh, or or you, 10 steps away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if... Uh, where calming signals come into play, for instance, in this dressage rhymes with massage, I want to be able to see calming signals in my horse telling me that the horse is feeling better. So some calming signals, um, it's not a perfect name. It's just an intriguing name, calming mm. signals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some signals are kind of accelerating in energy some are decelerating in energy. And so there are, before your horse's pole gets tense, there are a series of things that happen. And then before your horse's pole relaxes, there are a series of things that happen. Um, and so I'm going to take those all into account. And the one that might drive you nuts the most, it's a common calming signal for a horse to drop their nose down and rub their nose on their front leg. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Calming. You've seen it a million times. Absolutely. Um, that's a release. Yes. So uh, this neck stretch, um, if I were a natural horseman, I think I would call that a submissive position or, you know, a positive, passive position. Mm -hmm. As a dressage instructor, I'm going to say any time my horse's pole is lower than its withers, he's stretching his lumbar spine, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, as a rider, there were times I was told to jerk his head up and get to work. Absolutely, yes. I see that happen so many times. Riders are told, don't let that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so he's saying, I need a minute. Yep. I just need a breath. Just yep. let me stretch. And truly, if you leave them alone, it's crazy. They pick up their head and do exactly what you asked them to do. Yep. But we get into thinking it's disrespectful or some such, or just being told. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, if a horse does that with me, I'm, I'm going to give him a minute. Yep. That doesn't mean 
uh, you know, that in the middle of a dressage test, he's going to stop and scratch his nose. Um, But if I acknowledge to him that I hear him and that I will give him a minute, well, then he's going to give me a minute sometime down the road. There you go. Working the balance of both bank accounts. Yeah. I mean, if you're the leader, that means you're the one that does it first, that you, you know, you create a piece, an area of calm that is an attractive place that your horse works for you because he wants to because he volunteers and if everything we do is a correction um you know how'd that work you know this is one of the things that people and horses are similar at we don't like to be constantly corrected Hmm. well damn it anna i've got a show to go to and he's just got to do it right i know i know how nice for you. <laughs> oh, what a great response. <laughs> Have a nice day. Well, you know. And First I world think, problems, um, right? <laughs> well, and, you know, I mean, this is the challenge being a trainer is that we are expected to spit out a finished trained horse. Mm, yeah. And, you know, um, that's, not, that's not who horses are. Mm-hmm. That's not a realistic expectation right um it, you know those uh it, do, it just doesn't work that way um i like to be in the training situation that you described today uh <clears throat> that you know the three of you are going to work on this thing mm, yeah i mean you know that's what i see as successful yes yes and, you know, about what we can expect, but it will be at her time. Right, on her time, absolutely. Because we can't rush understanding, relaxation, or confidence, but we can help them mm-hmm. develop. We can egg them on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, again, um, that that's how you turn out that midlife horse that everybody raves about. Um, but you can't punish a horse to get to that place. Um, yeah. You know, I just see it so much. Don't you think that confidence is um, just the most important question? Confidence for- and relaxation, and I think they do come hand in hand for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I think one is... They're, yeah, they're sisters, they might- you know, they're, they're twins. Be- yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, you, 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 you don't find one without the other, really. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I feel like we could share stories forever um, about these things, and this is awesome. I'm so I'm so glad that you agreed to come on this with me. Uh, as we chatted before uh, before doing this, there's very few people that I talk to now on these podcasts that I haven't met, and I haven't met you before, and we really didn't know much about each other at all before we started this. And I kind of have the feeling that we could we could put in a really good effort for the longest podcast I've ever done. <laughs> And I don't think a slumber party is out of the question, except that at a certain point, I really actually do have to go out and feed horses. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Well, and I've I've got a nice drive to Rhode Island tomorrow morning. So uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm in the same boat that way. I'm in the same boat. Um, so I, I hope you don't mind. But is it all right with you if we take a couple questions that have come in through our listeners live? Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. So. Uh, let me see what we have here. Um, Kara has asked, what town do you happen to be in currently? I'm not sure if she's asking you that question or me that question, because a lot of our listeners know that I'm pretty much in a different town, if not every day, every two to three days. So what town are you in currently, Anna? I am in Peyton, Colorado, on a flat, windy, treeless prairie. <laughs> and is that where you live? This is where I live. Okay, Peyton, Colorado. Um, I travel less than you do. Ah, yes. Yeah, but where, I travel a lot. Where about is Peyton, Colorado? Uh, it's east of Colorado Springs. Gotcha. So it's, uh, you know, um, if I look out the window right in front of my desk where I'm sitting, I see my pond, and I see a little hillside, and then I see Pikes Peak in the distance. Ah, nice. 
Nice. I love I love my little farm. Yes, that sounds beautiful. That's a that's a lovely area. Years ago, I drove through there, flew into Colorado Springs, I believe, and drove all around. Yeah. yeah. Where are you at? Uh, I'm currently in a little town. This hotel is in uh, Morgantown, Pennsylvania, next to the town called Honeybrook. I've been in Honeybrook for the last couple of days, filming an online in hand course, actually. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, and tomorrow I'll be, I don't know, somewhere in Rhode Island. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. What else have we got here? You've got a lot of fans out there, Anna. We've got lots of comments on here about following you and loving you and reading your books, and this is fantastic. Um, here's oh, you know, a really. I, I'm really lucky. I have. You know, I'm not, I'm not just saying this. In the horse world, some of us manage to kind of, oh, I don't know, be backstabbers. And Facebook can be kind of a nasty place. It but can. I cannot say enough about the people who comment and uh, read my blog and post. Uh, statements of such support for each other mm. and um, share experiences in such a positive way. And, uh, you know, I hate to sound, you know, self-serving or something, but it's me that loves them. Um, you know, they have created my blog to be this really positive, nice place to be. So when they're saying, oh, here's what I want to say. You know how sometimes people will describe their horse to you, but what they're really describing is who they are? Have you ever had that experience as oh, a yes. trainer? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, what these guys are saying about my blog is actually what's true about them. Uh, they're wonderful people. That's fantastic. We must share the same fans then, because I always say that the folks uh, in my community are the best ones in the horse industry. So I'm thinking that they're that they're playing in two sandboxes here. They must be the same people that are coming yeah. over and visiting you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I you believe know, it. they're the best. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. So Jess has the question: As an author, who are your favorite authors to read? Ah. That's a great question. Well, it is. Um, I have to say, and, and it surprises me to say this, uh, uh, growing up, you know, over the years, I love literature. I like uh, English literature, and uh, there's some South American authors that I really like. I can tell you, I've taken to really enjoying memoir. Um, I really love people telling the stories of their own lives and um, their own experiences. And so, oh, geez, you know, it's like asking me who my, what my favorite movie is or what my favorite uh, book is. Yes. But what I can say is I love books that resonate with me personally. I love a story that I feel like I can get into and understand and relate to. Um, recently, uh, recently, comparatively, I started writing poetry, and I write poetry because I don't like poetry. Uh, uh. And I am finding, I'm redefining that for myself, and now there are some poets that I really enjoy reading. Uh, so I guess I'm going to say I like the next thing I read that isn't something I usually read. Oh, nice. And, That's great. Uh, you know, how much reading do you get done? Patrick? Um, I've actually found a way to get way more reading done in the last couple months than I've done in several years. I've, I've been on the road full on, full time, about 340 to 345 days of the year for the last five years now. Um, You're killing me. I, Ugh, and I'm loving it. Hard. I am such a gypsy at heart. If I'm home for more than two days, I start to get itchy. So it fits me perfectly. Um, but I've found uh, also living on the road so much, I have to really work hard to keep fit and to keep flexible and things like that. So I've found in most of the hotels I'm at, uh, they have a fitness center. They have a gym. So I'll spend anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour every day on a treadmill reading a book. That's how I catch up on my reading list, actually. 
That's smart. Yeah, well, I, I think it is. I don't know. I mean, it's it's um, it's my desire to multitask is what it is. <laughs> well, and, you know, I listen to um, a lot of podcasts, and I listen yes. to some books on tape. Yes. Um, the idea of, and you've answered my question perfectly, the idea of having time to sit down and read is not... Uh, available to me. Yes. Um, I read before I fall asleep at night. That's usually a page, maybe a page and a half. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. No, I get that. Yep, yep. Yep. Uh, awesome, awesome. So let's see. Looking through here. Okay, so Cindy wants to know, can you explain the leading from behind exercise again? Yeah. Uh, I will explain it as best I can. Yeah, I feel like that's and, something we have to see to to comprehend yeah. a little better. Yeah, I mean, here's the uh, here's how you can here's the short version. You stand at his drive line where the girth is, or farther back. You stand out of his space, no closer to his head than you would be if you were riding. Um, he does it. He takes you for a walk. Uh, if you ask him to walk, he takes the first step, not you. And you don't correct his head. You just say yes. It is an exercise in not cueing. It's an exercise in allowing your horse the autonomy to do what he wants to do. Um, and it's way, as anyone who has been to any of my clinics will tell you, it is really hard. <laughs> mm. And it's that notion that they get to be curious. It's a confidence builder for them. Now, do you put any limits on that? Um, yeah, sure. But not the ones you'd expect. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, if it is... Oh, here's something we do with horses that I don't think is fair. And I think that there's a time in the spring when my nose, which has been broken, can smell the grass. Mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. I can smell the grass, well, then that's not fair. Do you know what I mean? Uh, there, it's a couple of weeks every spring when the horses are just driven nuts by the smell of fresh grass, I can okay. tell. So then I'm going to leave from behind in an arena. Gotcha. Yep, yep. Be so I guess you'll call that a line, meaning it's not fair to think he's going to want to do anything but, you know, graze. Right. Sure. So that's fine. We can do that. Um, you know... Uh, the leading from behind is about giving him choice, which means that we have to stop grabbing and overthinking. It's, it's much more about what we're doing than what they're doing. Again, and this is what's great about the question from her and from you, we're looking for what, what is the result I'm looking for? Well, it's not about you and your result. <laughs> ah. That's what I mean to say. Nice. It's not about you. <laughs> nice. Nice. So he has the say. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, this young horse, uh, they're just walking on the rail. Um, sometimes she'll ask him to do a circle, and then he'll do something that she'll follow. You pass the leadership as if you were partners back and forth. Um, okay. We are very uh, result-oriented, technique-oriented, mm, yes. um, and uh, what I all any of my clients ever say to me every year, I say, "What are your goals for the year? Or what should we work on this year?" And every year, they all say the exact same thing: "I want a better relationship with my horse." Mm. Now, I would like it if they would say, I'd like a better canter transition. <laughs> right. That'd be so much easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, Gosh. but no, they would rather have the universe. And right. so, because <laughs> they want the universe, uh, you know, then if it's about relationship, that's a different goal. Yes. And, you know, I'm going to say the dreaded word trust, because I think the biggest problem humans have with horses is the lack of trust 
and it is not that we don't trust that we'll get hurt or something like that. It's not that trust. We don't trust that they're actually intelligent, and they are. Mm -hmm. And so I want to teach people to trust the intelligence of their horses. That's a very interesting concept. That's very interesting. Yeah, that silence scared me just a little bit. Oh, goodness, no. No, no, no. No, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking in my head, because I've worked with some horses, several horses, that have been kept in uh, not-so-horsey situations for most, if not all, of their lives. Uh, Stall-bound, very minimal turnout, little, if any, socialization, things like that. Those are horses that often I think I would refer to as poor decision makers. Basically because they've had a, a, a learning challenge or an experience challenge. So what about those horses? Um, well, I would call them abused. I wouldn't yes. call them poor and, decision and I would And I would agree with you a thousand percent on that, yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, you know, they Situational are... Situational abuse, they, environmental abuse. They are, yeah, they are yeah. in this position through no choice and with no autonomy. Yes. Uh, and they're in solitary confinement. Uh, we yes. save that for the very worst criminals in our, in our culture yes. and horses. Um, and it seems like the more expensive the horse, the more so sometimes. Um, you know, uh, there's nothing I can do for that horse if I can't get the owner to understand that it is such an unnatural life for him that he cannot behave in a natural way. Yes. And so, you know, I'm not going to look to the horse in that situation. I'm going to look to the person. So I think this is where I say one more time, um, I'm a horse advocate. Yeah. First and foremost and always. Because, I, you know, I can help that horse. You bet. Mm -hmm. But first, we have to change his life. Absolutely. The entire environment has to change. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He's a product of all of that. Absolutely. And it... And, you know, this thing, I think uh, we are all trying to do this totally impossible task. And the impossible task is to own horses as naturally as we can. Sure. Uh, but none of us have 5,000 acres. None of us, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And, uh, and, and it's not like wild horses have a great life, by the way. You right, know? exactly. <laughs> um, it's like, you know, we have to find a way to communicate in their language and get a reasonable facsimile to the greatest degree that we can um, of a natural life for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that has to be our goal. I agree, yes. And, you know, I run into horses like that all the time, mm -hmm. you know. Right. I, th I think... Uh, I think that there are a whole lot more, um, what do I want to say? I'm going to call that horse uh, almost abused by love. Does that make sense? It, it does. I, I, it makes sense to me because we know that those owners, it's, it's not an intentional abuse. It's a desire to keep everything very sanitary, very sterile for those horses so they don't ever get hurt and, or, you know, yeah. Yeah, and, and very safe. And, and um, we would rather over-own them. Uh, it's just so hard to let a horse be a horse. Yeah. And that's why I advocate it so much because I swear they are so much cooler as horses than yes. anything we manipulate them into being. Yes. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you can't compete. And it doesn't mean that you can't win. Uh, I, I am not a fan of, uh, you know, um, standing in a pasture with horses or, you know, as a routine. 
Uh, although I certainly do spend a lot of time standing around with horses. <laughs> I, I mean, I have I have goals, and and mm-hmm. I am the one that thinks they can love working. Yes. Um, I think you can make it that way. Sure. Uh, it's harder. You know, it's mm-hmm. harder for the human to do it that way. But if we are theoretically the advanced species, we're the ones who should make the changes first. Yes. Well, you know, we're. I think this all the time. Uh, we are our horse's life coach as well as his fitness coach. And we need to design a life program and a fitness program that he looks forward to that he would rather stick to in spite of us or if we weren't there. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And... Uh, It'd be good if we could do that for ourselves, too. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, God, in my poetry book, there is a poem entitled Life Coach. Oh, really? Oh, man. And it's about a goat. <laughs> oh, I love it. I, love I mean, it. I think if we were all more goat life, like, <laughs> you know, we'd do better. Well, at the end of a long day of teaching, sometimes in the summer, I kind of smell a little goat-like, if that counts. <laughs> well, I, however you can get there, Patrick, I, you know, um, perhaps you have not invested the time that I have. Ah, uh, this could be. In, in the goat world, you know. <laughs> uh, you should consider it because goats are an antidote to type A behavior. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, every dressage barn should have a goat just to keep us a little based in reality. <laughs> and another one of my opinions that has not caught on nationwide, I might add. <laughs> but but have you have you seen or have you partaken yourself in the new goat yoga craze? No, and I practice yoga. <laughs> but you haven't um, practiced goat yoga? You are totally missing out. So I hear. Can I can I just say this one thing, those cute videos? My yoga teacher may speak to me later about this, but, Uh-oh. you know, she and I, I tell you, she, I give a writing lesson just like she gives a yoga lesson. Um, so we have a lot in common. Do you notice that those are all baby goats? Yeah. How long do you think that would last? <laughs> right? My goat weighs about 120 pounds, maybe a little more. <laughs> and he has pointy little hooves. Yes. Uh, so no, no. <laughs> Imagine him jumping on your back during a downward dog pose, right? Well, and it's not like he doesn't, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, again, if you think you can control the way this works, right. good for you. If right. you think you can get a goat to eat the weeds on your property, well, good for you. Keep <laughs> yes. yourself a locked up. <laughs> Isn't that the you truth? Know, we can control them even a little worse than we can control horses, which is probably what I like about them. Yeah. They just yeah. just keep me honest. You they know? are their own people, aren't they? Oh, yeah, and don't particularly care about you. And, you know, for some of us who are people pleasers and constantly apologizing and constantly on the schedule, it's just good to get drug around by a goat every now and then. <laughs> Keeps it real. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, gosh. So, uh, Rosalind asks, are you having any classes soon? Um, I've got a bunch of clinics coming up, and they're all on my website. Uh, Good. It, it, shockingly, and, you know, I know, Patrick, this is just going to make your eyes glaze over. I'm going to be home for an entire month. <gasps> I'm oh. really excited about it. That's awesome. Good. And so far this year, I've gone to New Zealand and uh, Australia and Scotland and England and quite a few places in the U.S., including a spectacular trip to Alaska. And uh, I'm, I'm taking this month to be here because I actually have clients here. Oh, nice. <laughs> who, nice. Yeah, they're saints. You know, they're thrilled that I get to travel and uh you know, I'm not available to them as I would like to be. So I'm going to be here for a few schooling shows for a couple of my clients uh, because Good. it's really important to me to do that. Mm-hmm. And then I'll head off uh, in September to Canada and Washington State and California and Oregon and then another big trip that's almost finalized, but not quite nice. finalized yet. Nice. Good. Yeah. 
Yeah, Fantastic. So I'll, be, I'll be coming and going. And then, you know, the other thing that I would say, if you're listening, um, uh, my blog has in the right column every place I'm going. Or if you want to, you can put me your email with where you live, and then I'll notify you when I come to your neck of the woods. Um, I don't travel like Patrick does, but I, I travel a whole lot if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. Are you primarily West Coast when you're traveling? Well, and, and I know you said New Zealand, Australia, but in the in the states, are you primarily West Coast? No, no, I'm okay. shocked. Uh, I'm uh, in uh, the next couple of months. I'm going to California, and I have never been there before. Oh, okay. okay. I know. Go figure. Um, I go all over. I've never been in the Northeast, uh, which is seems to be where you travel some. I spend quite a bit of time here in the Northeast. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, trust me. If somebody up there gives me a call, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chase you down to the per hotel you're staying in. Hey, um, I don't know if that's a promise or a threat, but I'm gonna make that happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, either way is fine with me. Right there, we go. <laughs> <laughs> either either way is fine. Um, so yeah, I don't even have. Uh, I get to go to Washington State. Uh, some and I really love it up there, so that's really pleasant mm, nice. to me. Um, and this whole international part uh, was something I never expected. And sometimes I think, you know, how in the old west there were outriders, they might have been ministers or school teachers, or uh, mm, yes. you know, they would travel from town to town with the news and. Mm -hmm provide a service that judge that judges used to write circuits. I feel like I do that. And I really love getting to go the distances I'm going because uh, it's fascinating, if nothing else, it's fascinating to figure out how people manage owning their horses in such diverse climates. Um, mm, yeah. You know, I, I do it for that, uh, you know, uh, the struggle of uh, owning a horse in New Zealand um, as rich and lush as that country is, is a huge challenge. You know, they can't race all day. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, interesting. interesting. And so, you know, I, I like having a, a large circuit, but then again, it's really, oh, here's the simple answer. I've given you the long answer. This is the simple answer. When somebody invites me somewhere, I say yes. I was just going to, I could have finished your sentence right there. I was going to say, that's right, your business yeah. plan. You say yes. <laughs> yeah, I just say yes, and then I wind up someplace there. You know, people say, would you ever consider? And it's like, yeah, ask yep. me. You bet, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it worked really well training horses to just say yes all the time. There so you I've go. I've taken it up with people, and I'm having great response. Good, good, good. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, here we've got a question from Gail. Gail says, <laughs> it's a three-word question, help, nippy pony. Four-word answer. Leave his head alone. Ooh. Well, I just thought I'd answer him like. Uh, so I'll give you a sweeter answer now. Um... Have you answered the question that way before? Have, have you been presented with it that you've said four-word answer? Or did you just come up with that on the fly? Because I'm really impressed if you did. Because I would have to probably say it in my head three times and then count it on my fingers before I could say it. And that was, that was a fast well, reply. Maybe I take a dare quicker than you do. <laughs> um, and granted, it was a dare of my own. Uh, so, again, I'm a horse advocate. Uh, Horses are born incredibly sensitive on their noses. Uh, this is something I have so much passion about. I'm not sure that this person asking the question hasn't set me up to say something that I always want to say. Uh. So they're born with these incredibly sensitive noses. That's how they find their mothers and nurse. And they're very, very ticklish because of such a high percentage of nerve endings there in their noses. Mm -hmm. It's how they survive. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a tendency to mangle horse noses. They reach out to sniff us. That's all they're doing. They yes. just want to smell. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. And we grab their nose and think that they're making some sort of connection with us. Mm-hmm. They're not. Mm-hmm. Um, but we tend to overstimulate their nose. Sometimes nippiness comes from that. Sometimes nippiness comes from uh, treats. And, uh, you know, I make people mad when I say this, but I don't use treats. I want to be the treat. I want me mm. to be the treat. Yep. Yep. And so... I don't want to stimulate his face, which, by the way, we tend to manhandle more than we're aware of anyway. Right. So I don't actually touch horses on their noses. I'll touch them on their cheek. Um, usually I touch them on their bodies. But uh, if a horse is aggressive uh, with his nose, it could be something like that. And then the other thing I'll say is, uh, they'll bite at you if you're standing too close and they want a little space. They'll bite at you if they've given you 50 or 60 calming signals that you haven't listened to. They'll up the volume and, and nip at you. Um, sometimes they bite when they're in pain. Uh, my answer, to, I, I, I will never know in a brief period of time which of those things this horse is responding to. Mm-hmm. But what I'm going to do is take him at his word and get out of his face. Mm. Okay. And then I'll continue the conversation. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Gail's actually just put in a, com- uh, a confirming message here that he's a sneak nipper, um, and it's not necessarily when she's touching his head. And that's bringing to mind, even for me, some of those moments when, and I don't know, because I, I don't know if I know Gail or not, because I'm terrible with names, unfortunately. That's part of my traveling so much. I meet, you know, probably 200, 300 new people every month. So I, I yeah, hate no it. I admit to being terrible with names. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Um, so, Gail, if we have met, and I do know you, I apologize, but I don't know you by your full name on Facebook, at least. Um, but um, the sneak nipping, I see that sometimes with horses when people are tacking up uh, that I find to often be related to ulcers. Yep, exactly. Or Absolutely. chiropractic issues or other muscular tension issues. Um, and then maybe I, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. What I tend to find is that the two main places I find horses holding most of their tension is in their jaw and their lumbar spine. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm also going to say there are pressure points for ulcers under the girth. So yes. girthing, yes. you know, that's like a huge, I would have to add that to the list. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm going to think it's, it's pain first of some sort. Mm-hmm. Second, I'm going to say if he is sneaking up and biting, um, you know, it is not a natural behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it is a behavior and not a pain response, and I'm going to say 95% of me thinks it's pain when you when you put it that way and say it's not about treats. Um, you know, I'm really going to lean towards pain. Um, I'm going to... Oh, become aware of what my body is doing when he nips. Mm, uh, you say he comes out of nowhere. I want you to, you know, get a little, uh, uh, do a little uh, equine CSI work and really figure out when he does it and when he doesn't do it. And it's going to take time, but trace it down. Mm-hmm. Kind of keeping um, a mental certain- log of when it happens and what's going on in that situation. Yeah, and mm-hmm. what your body is doing where you are in his space or out of his space, whether you're facing him or, you, have, you know, all of those things. I'm going to take take all of those things into consideration. And uh, the one thing I'm going to say for sure is that there's going to be no disciplining him out of this because I think he is expressing something that is important. Yeah. Does that, do yeah. you know what I mean? I, I, I think I, I mean, do, yeah. This isn't, you, this isn't bad ground manners. Um, this is, you know, there's a little more energy to it, and so that would tell me that there's probably something going on. Something underlying, I, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so, um, gosh, and again, I know we could keep going forever, and we have just gone over our two-hour mark, so we're nearing into the longer of our, we've entered into the realm of our longer podcasts. I love it. This is so much fun. Um, and, and before I abuse your time too much, because I certainly want to be respectful of that, uh, I think I'd love to get into some of our wrap-up questions, if you don't mind. Awesome, cool. Um, so, if there was one specific thing that you could recommend that riders focus on as a primary means of improving their horsemanship or their dressage, however you want to think of it, what would that be? Oh, God, that one is so easy, breathing. It's just the only thing that matters. <laughs> breathing. breathing, good. It's the hardest thing for us to do next to thinking, but it is pretty darn yeah. important. Uh, yeah, but I mean, you know... How, I think how you relax a horse's top line is with your breath. Mm, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. I mean, we don't think it's going to work, so we don't commit ourselves to it. Right. But I swear, if you know, if I was going to get like a, if I was going to create a training aid that everybody who liked me would buy and thereby make me rich, uh, that's what it would be: breath. Yes. It's the it's the only thing that always works. There you go. Well, and it's so connected to our physiology that when we're riding, influences hugely the horse's physiology, so it makes perfect sense. Yep. Yeah, awesome. If you could ride with anyone, past or present, who would it be and why? Ride with them. Yeah, ride with them. Whether it's in a lesson uh, or just ride alongside them for the day. Yeah, uh, you know, I'd ride with Nuno uh, Oliveira. And... Uh, if it was a conversation, I'd say somebody else. Um, yeah, I want to walk on a horse next to him walking on a horse. Mm. So now, okay, you've piqued my interest. I'll, I'll snag at that bait. If it's a conversation with anyone, <laughs> who would it be and why? Xenophon. Uh. It would be Xenophon in a hot moment because... Uh, he, uh, my all-time favorite quote is a Xenophon quote uh, that goes something like, what a horse does under compulsion is done without understanding and there's no beauty in it yes. any more than if one should whip or spur a dancer. Yes. I want to have a conversation with him about positive training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's very intriguing. I love that. What is your present personal definition of I'm going to give you horsemanship or dressage, whichever you would prefer. Your present personal definition. Uh, safety. And it's not what you're thinking. Uh, when I think of horsemanship or riding or dressage or leadership or partnership or whatever word you want to use, I think what horses are looking for to me for is safety mm. their safety yeah so that's what I think good leadership is is providing safety nice nice and if they feel that they have that they have the confidence they get the relaxation and then the understanding comes through yeah and then we'll be often yeah then we're doing tempi changes then the world's yeah. a happy place that's fantastic what book are you currently reading or what was the last book that you read? Um, I can't remember the name of the very last book I read, but a couple of books ago I read H is for Hawk, H-A-W-K. Uh, it was a popular book a couple of years ago, uh, an English author whose name will, of course, escape me now, too. It talks about training hawks, and I just found it fascinating. Ah. I really recommend it. H is for hawks. So you recommend it? Yeah, oh, highly. That's, that's very it's, interesting. I have a friend who actually um, da, is a falconer and hunts horseback, so I'm going to have to ask him if he's got that and see if I can snag it and borrow it. Oh, and he would, uh, I bet he, well, I'd be surprised if he didn't just rave about it. I bet he's read it because it's, you know, it's his line of uh, expertise. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I'm definitely going to look that up. That's fascinating. 
Awesome. Um, okay, so I'm going to steal a question from another podcaster, Tim Ferriss, that I like to listen to quite a bit. Um, if you had a giant billboard to print any message you wanted on for the world to see it, what would the message be? Just say yes. Ah, I knew it. I knew it going into the question. I, you know, I have this catchy phrase that I use all the time, less correction, more direction. But, you know, it's easier to just say yes. I'm writing that one down. Less correction and more direction. I love that. I take notes the whole time that I do these, and sometimes I get some really <laughs> awesome quotes, so I am writing, I'm snagging that one. Yeah, awesome. Very cool. All right, now here's a pretty important one. How can folks find you? How can they find out what you're doing? How can they interact with you? How can they continue on with these conversations? So, um, my website where everything happens is called Anna Blake blog.com and so that's how you find me online and you know I'm on Facebook uh, with my name Anna Blake and uh, I'm pretty easy to find I'm, you know I'm right I'm right out there they could check your website I think <laughs> they could absolutely absolutely and this this will be uh, this will be available um, on my website very soon too probably by tomorrow Perfect. Fantastic. Great. All right. Now, so here's a tricky one that I didn't tell you about, that I never tell anybody about, because it's about the element of surprise. Um, most of the time when I do videos or when I do these audio broadcasts, we have a question of the day. And the question of the day is something that we get to ask, or I get to ask, the audience. I've been asking you questions all this time. Now the opportunity is yours to ask a question of our audience. And they get to answer it, or they have to answer it through the comment section on this post. So, question of the day, and I'm going to turn it over to you. What is our question of the day for our audience? How can I best advocate for my horse? Oh, I love that. I love it's that. It's about them. It's not about us. Yeah. That's fantastic. Gang, you heard it. Anna Blake, her question of the day, how can I best advocate for my horse? Give us the answer there in the comment section for this video. I'm really looking forward to reading your answers, and I have a feeling Anna's going to check back to read your answers as well. Oh, Anna, thank you oh, yeah. so much for this. This has thank been you. so this much fun. so much fun, Patrick. I, we're, you know, we're siblings, you and I. I think so. I think so. I think we were separated at birth somehow, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting. We've had several comments come in that this has been the favorite podcast for many of our listeners. And um, I'm going to agree. It's, it's definitely in my top of favorite podcasts so far. I've had so much fun with this. It has been fun. Yes. It has. You and I are going to meet up sometime. I know it. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. And I'm just going to share this with you about the question of what was the last book you read. We have uh, my friend Krista, a student from Illinois, uh, Wisconsin area. She just had to type in. Of course she did because Krista's kind of a smart ass like that. She belongs in our sibling group. I'm just going to say that. Um, <laughs> she says it would have been funny if your answer would have been Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> well, does she know I have all gray horses? Um, <laughs> well, she does now. <laughs> well, and you know, in hindsight, I think I should have mentioned one of my own books, shouldn't I? <laughs> you right. It would have been a. I gave you a perfect marketing opportunity I know, there. I, I mean, know. geez. I know. And, you know, so it goes. So it goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, thank you again so much. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time here for us. Thank you, Patrick. Absolutely. So hang on just one moment, if you would. And thank you so much, gang, for tuning in for episode number 31 of Talking About Horses. I really appreciate you giving Anna and I your ear and your time. Please remember that if you've missed any of it, you can access the full broadcast through Facebook, YouTube, 
iTunes or by streaming directly from my website by accessing the Talking About Horses page from the Education drop-down menu. Through whatever platform you're listening, please be sure to give us a rating, a comment, a review, and a share with your friends. Your word of mouth and support is the fuel for this fire. Thank you so much again, gang. Hey there, gang. Patrick King here. Every other week, I send out an exclusive email newsletter to help riders reach their goals with their horses. These 5-Bit Friday emails include evaluations of exercises and movements for your horse, rider psychology tips, my personal reviews of books or videos, important thoughts on equitation, anatomy insights, quotes to ponder, lots more. 5-Bit Friday is only available if you subscribe to our email list. If you're interested in receiving these exclusive emails, register today by visiting my website at pkhorsemanship.com forward slash newsletter. Thank you in advance for signing up, and I hope you enjoy and gain lots of value from 5-Bit Friday. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Talking About Horses with Patrick King. If you enjoyed today's show, please leave a review and subscribe. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit pkhorsemanship.com. We'll catch you next time.